Hey everybody, Connie Knox, a lifelong genealogist, helping you go further, faster, factually with your family research. I'm on my way to the office right now, but I wanted to let you know about part two coming up of the U.S. Federal Census, taking us from 1850 to 1940. So, enjoy part two of this three-part series. Let's talk now a little bit more about the 1850 through the 1870 census. This is where things start to change a little bit. So in the 1850 to 1870 census, they listed all the family members, but not the relationship to the head of household. So now in this example, we have, I'll make it a little bigger so you can see it. Uh, we have Alfred Hickman, his wife Sarah. We assume, right? We assume they're the same age, but we don't know that Sarah could be a sister. So it could be a twin sister. I don't know. But I'm going to assume right now that Sarah Hickman is Alfred's wife. Now, here we have William, and, you know, they give us the little ditto marks here showing that these are the same last names. We have William Hickman who is 19 years old, and he is a male, and he's a farm laborer. Okay, so one would assume that William is the son of Alfred Hickman, but not necessarily so. Keep in mind that back in the farming days, young, especially young men, but young people were loaned out to other families to help either run the household, in the case of females, and or help run the farm uh, in the case of males. So this William uh, Hickman could be a nephew or maybe a much younger brother, but it's not likely. Most likely he is a son, but until we prove that, we don't know that for sure. So be mindful of that. Be careful not to make assumptions. Uh, keep in mind that he could be a, a servant, a laborer, another family member, he could be a cousin, you know, who knows. So also keep in mind that um, free and slave schedules were separated between 1850 and 1860. This is an example of a uh, slave schedule, and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. Uh, in this case, uh, the name of the slave owner in this one is William Melvin. Number of slaves is one. It says here, age is 65, sex is female, color is black, number of slave houses one. But then if you'll notice, there's no names for any of these slaves. So they're la labeled, they're just left blank. So here we have one 20 year old female who is black, one 17 year old male who is black, one three-year-old male who is mulatto, the M means mulatto, and one one-year-old male who is mulatto. Moving on to the 1880 uh, and to the 1940 census, so now we're moving into an era where there's a little bit more information. So the uh, census records for 1880 to 19, uh, 1890, excuse me, in 1880, they began uh, listing the relationship to the head of household in cities. They listed the streets, which was kind of cool. Um, there's also health uh, questions, usually in the form of disabilities, like uh, are they deaf? Are they blind? I've seen insane, idiotic. Um, there's, there's a variety of different um, labels that they used. And they've also started adding parents' birthplace, which is important. Also keep in mind in 1890, sadly, most of the 1890 census was destroyed. Um, a lot of people think it was destroyed by fire. It was actually destroyed by water and mold um, from a fire. When they put the fire out, all the water trickled down to the basement uh, where the records were stored. And they left them there for a long period of time, uh, not knowing what to do with them from what I understand. 
and so those records ultimately uh, became unusable. There are a few records that survive, very few, and there are some of the 1890 veterans' census schedules that survived. So one of the things that I want to emphasize is to write down your sources, but let's take a look at this record for a moment. So here we have a record for Henry Henley and his wife Nancy C. and their son John. And we know that because now they're starting to label the relationship here. Um, but this is for Randolph, or excuse me, Randleman Township in Randolph County, North Carolina. Again, you always want to pay attention to the dates. We also want to pay attention to all the information on the top, and we want to document that. We also want to document the dwelling and the family number. I even document the line number a lot of times. Um, white, male, 71 years old. We want to document all of this, and there's actually more on this page. I just couldn't show it to you here. But we want to make sure that we're documenting everything. So here I found on Ancestry.com this record, and I just want to be able to uh, zoom in a little bit and show you um, the different details because it is kind of important. You're going to, the enumeration district, supervisory district, page number, the enumeration district ends up, and the page number end up in a proper source citation, as does the township, the county, and the state. Um, in this case, I also want to show you, we're going to get down a little bit closer here. They are uh, listed here, the uh, dwelling number being 234, the family number being 255. This was the order in which the census taker walked from house to house. So uh, this was the 255th person this, this uh, enumerator uh, took. And by the way, if you ever want to know who that is, his name is up here on the top. Um, and so moving back down, Henry Henley, Nancy C., and John, you know, if you hover over it, it says John H. Um, again, this is a this is the version that Ancestry has, but you can also find it on um, Family Search. The rice is white. He's male. He's seventy-one. Nancy's seventy years old. Uh, she is keeping house. What does this say? He says he works on the farm. And oh, looky there! I was wrong. It's not his son. It's his grandson. He is 19 years old. So this is why you want to pay attention to all the details. He is single. And see what else we can learn. Birth of this person, all three of them. Hmm. No, grandson was born in South Carolina. Okay, there's a clue. All right, so uh, Henry and Nancy were both born in North Carolina. Their parents, look. Birthplace of father of this person. So they were born in North Carolina. It looks like all of the parents of these lines, of these people, were born in North Carolina. So there's a lot of good information. Um, the 1880 census is a phenomenal uh, census. Unfortunately, the sad news is that <laughs> the 1890 census was almost completely destroyed. So then we have to skip over to the 1900 census. So point being is that we need to write down all of our source information. Sources are crazy important because if you don't write down your source information um, 10 years from now when you're trying to go back and find that information again or you want to look at it a little bit closer, maybe you, maybe that 2 was actually a 3 because there was some funny little, or that 3 was an 8 or whatever, you're not sure, you want to go back and look at the actual source information. Um, you're going to need to know where you found it, and that's that's super important. So there are a couple ways you can write down the sources. In um, I've been trained to uh, do source citations from Elizabeth Schoen Mills, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But um, these are a couple different ways you can write that source citation for that census record that we just took a look at. In this case, um, this top one would be is if you were viewing that on microfilm at maybe one of the archives. And so uh, here 
it says the 1880 U.S. Census, Randleman Township, Randolph County, North Carolina. It was a population schedule, which is important to make sure that you note because it could have been a slave schedule, an agricultural schedule. It could have been something different. So you have to make sure that you label that as a population schedule. The enumeration district, also known as an ED, was 213. It was page 30B, and it was handwritten on the top of the page. Sometimes you'll see this, it says stamped. Uh, it was dwelling 234, and the family was 255, as we discussed before. This was an entry for Henry Henley. Sometimes you'll see the word entry in front here. And the semicolon is a break saying that we really have two sources in one here. Um, because the original source was from the National Archives and Records Administration uh, microfilm publication T9, roll number 978. So T9 is the uh, publication for the entire 1880 census. So the other option is to um, is to record this as I would have done for this one because I was viewing it on Ancestry.com. So that would be the, uh, in quotes, 1880 U.S. Uh, states, uh, United States Census database, right? Ancestry. Uh, and here we have the uh, actual address. And then accessed on the 23rd of September, uh, 2018. And the reason you do that is because things change. So when you accessed the database, and then we actually drilled through the database and looked at the actual image, but um, then we would write uh, in, an entry for Henry Henley. He was the age 71, um, district number two, uh, page 308, Randleman Township, Randolph County, North Carolina, citing. Okay, so here's the break again. It shows that we are citing uh, the original source as the National Archives and Record Administration uh, microfilm publication T9. And the actual proper way of writing that source citation from best that I understand would be that you would put a period at the end of T9, but I like the roll number on there as well, so I added it. I uh, um, am a, a firm believer that more information, is, uh, the more information you have, the better. Um, that way, uh, the whole goal behind source citations is that anybody, a stranger, not necessarily you, but you later on down the road too, that anybody can follow your footsteps right to the exact record and exact line in which you uh, discovered the information. So keep in mind, that's what you're doing when you're writing source citations. Now, do you need to write it exactly perfect uh, as the pros do? No, not necessarily, but you do want to have all the information there. However, if you want to learn how to write uh, source citations the way the pros do, uh, you want a copy of Elizabeth Schoen Mills, and I actually have my copy here. Let's see if I can show it to you. There it is. All, all of my little tabs, this, this book is well used. Um, and it is, a lot of people will say writing source citations is an art and uh, it is not an exact science. If you want to learn to write source citations, get the book. It's worth it. Now, I have a link in the show notes, and it's also shown here on the screen. Let me make it a little bigger so you can see it. That link will take you straight to Amazon.com and to the this book. Now, make sure that you're looking for the latest edition. You can even go back and search for it again once you get to Amazon and... Uh, type evidence explain to make sure that you have the latest edition because at the time of this recording I believe this is to be the latest edition, but she's updating that all the time. Elizabeth Schoen Mills is probably the one source. Well, there are other sources, but she's kind of the, the gold standard for writing source citations for genealogists. Um, so, full disclosure, that link is an affiliate marketing link. Uh, for which I get paid a tiny commission to help support the videos. So if you use that link, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. It will not cost you a dime more uh, to use that link, uh, but it does help support uh, Genealogy TV. So moving on. Census records for 1900 to 1940. Beginning in the 1900 census, 
uh, citizenship information was added. The year of immigration, naturalization status was added. So in the naturalization columns, you'll see NA for naturaliz naturalized persons, uh, PA for first papers filed. So when a person uh, was going to become naturalized, they had to file papers first. And uh, if I recall, they had to have been in the United States at least five years before they could do that. And then the AL was uh, for alien. In the 1920 census starts showing the year of naturalization, which can be helpful. However, uh, be forewarned that that information could be wrong, as I learned the hard way. <laughs> because one of my ancestors said they were naturalized and showed the year of naturalization, which was impossible because they had not been in the United States for five years yet. So um, just be mindful that, and some people may have thought they were naturalized and they were not. So um, question everything. That's what I always say, question everything. Moving on to the 1930 census, uh, they added information about whether they rent or own their home, the property value or the monthly rent, whether they had a radio in the house, uh, whether they're uh, on a farm or not, and uh, a veteran of any wars. Now, that's not, I don't think that's all the information, but that's some of the, the key information that you can find there in the 1940 census. So, Census records from 1900 1940, the 1940 census actually shows another column that I absolutely love. It says, what is your residence on April 1st, 1935? So here we are in 1940, and it's asking you where you lived five years previous. Well, there was no, there was no census record you know, right, we had 1930 and then we had 1940, but they're asking where you were in 1935. So in a way, it's kind of like a mini census as to where were you in 1935. So that kind of gave us another little five-year glimpse backwards in time. So, and keep in mind when you're doing census research, you're always going backwards, right? You are working from death to birth. So you're doing the same thing with census records. You're going backwards. So if your person was born in, say, 1909, you're starting with, excuse me, died in 1909. You're starting with 1900. Then you doubt you're going to find anything in 1890, but then you're going to jump back to 1880, 1870. So you're going to work backwards. Um, so you can start building out the family group that way too, and you'll start seeing people drop off as they're not born yet as you go back in time. I hope you enjoyed part two. Coming up next in part three, click on the card to get to part three, is the strategy about how to find your family in records, in census records, prior to 1850 when uh, you can't see all the names of all the family members but only the head of household so please stick around click on the card for part three and enjoy <laughs>